Okay, Commissioner Delari, we are now recording and streaming live to YouTube, so you can go ahead and start the meeting whenever you'd like. Good morning. Today is June 29th, 2020. It's approximately 9 a.m. I'd like to welcome you to Metro Plan of Orlando's virtual meeting. Uh, I'd like to call the meeting to order. Uh, my name is Bob Delari. I'm a county commissioner of Seminole County and the chair of Metro Plan Orlando. Uh, our team of folks will be working to ensure this meeting runs very smoothly. Uh, so we all just need to be a little patient. Uh, today's meeting was advertised on the Metro Plan Orlando's website, social media, as well as through targeted emails. The Florida Sunshine Law typically requires a quorum to be physically present in a room for government meetings. However, our governor, Governor Santos DeSantis, uh, suspended this requirement in his executive order allowing government boards to conduct businesses using virtual meetings. This order has now been extended through the month of July. I would now like to ask uh, Commissioner Jane of Mosquillo County to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Can we all stand please, Commissioner? Thank you, Commissioner Delari. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Commissioner. Next, we have Thank a short. You. Next, we have a short video to review the virtual meeting guidelines. Staff. Welcome to Metro Plan Orlando's virtual meeting. Here are some things you should know. Board and committee members are active participants and members of the public are observers. Our chairperson will make sure to keep the meeting flowing. Please keep your microphone or phone line muted unless recognized to speak. Make sure to pay attention to your video controls as well. Participants are welcome to use the raise hand feature to ask questions after presentations. This feature can be found when clicking on the participants icon. When recognized by the chair to speak, you can unmute yourself. Please make sure to speak clearly so everyone can hear you. You may also submit questions via the chat box by clicking on the chat icon. A moderator will relay your question. Thank you. Thank you. So let's try to keep our microphones muted unless uh, we've been recognized to speak and please use the raise hands feature to participate in the discussion. There'll be two public comment points in the meeting. Members of the public who want to speak will be using the raise hands feature found in the participation tab. If attending by phone, you can use star nine to raise your hand and request to be recognized. When you're called, your microphone will be temporarily unmuted by staff and will ask to state your name and uh, contact information for the record. We'll also be set, accepting comments by email or phone messages before the meeting. The guidelines for this public comments are posted at the metroplanorlando.org forward slash virtual meetings. Public comments received before the meeting will be read by the staff at the conclusion of today's meeting. If you want this and any future online meetings to be uh, accessible to all, Participants may join by the computer, tablet, or phone. If you need uh, any accommodations or help uh, to participate in the future, please contact the Metro Plan Orlando staff. Uh, I want to thank the board members for adjusting their schedule to accommodate uh, the, us to advance the July board meeting a couple of weeks. Uh, we didn't know whether the governor was gonna extend the executive order allowing us to have uh, meetings by virtual. Uh, I want to thank the government for doing that. Uh, it's very important to us that we all remain safe. And I want to thank all the members as well as the staff in advance for doing all the hard work to get the meeting ready. I'd also like to uh, give a word that we found out last night that Commissioner Van Belay's brother passed away unexpectedly uh, yesterday. Uh, so please, uh, our hearts and prayers go out to not just uh, the commissioner, but her entire family for her brother. We also received an additional notice this morning that the Eatonville Mayor Cole daughter passed away yesterday as well. Uh, I'd like to ask Gary to look into, uh, Gary, our executive director, excuse me, to look into making uh, arrangements if it's appropriate 
uh, please reach out to each one of the families, either uh, flowers and on behalf of uh, our family, uh, Metropolitan Orlando, and the family of the Commissioner Van Lee, as well as Mayor Cole. Uh, it would also uh, be helpful if we provide the address to the board, each one of the board members, if we wish to extend a private uh, message of condolence. Safety is our primary concern here in Central Florida. In fact, uh, uh, we've all been working very hard at it, and there's many different uh, ways that we've been doing this. Two areas, uh, we received some good news earlier this month. Metroplan Orlando participating in UCF FDOT has been awarded uh, one of the eight nation nationwide crash predictability grants. Uh, this is a grant that nearly $295,000 much of it will be going to be the uh, UCF area uh, uh, for the uh, safety. Uh, an interesting uh, approach to this award is that it will be including working on transportation safety grant, uh, will include first responders as well as uh, healthcare providers in the trauma center. Metroplan Orlando will lead the collaboration with FDOT and UCF to make safety uh, tools and information more useful uh, for practitioners by developing and redefining them by addressing specific safety problems in the Metro Orlando area. I know that Gary will be saying a little more on this during his uh, announcements. Central Florida uh, MPO Alliance has a similar organization from the Tampa Bay area will be holding a joint transportation summit on July 10th. This meeting will focus on TISMO uh, in the I-4 corridor and how we can all work together to improve the operation of I-4. Uh, I will also be attending that and uh, will encourage anyone else who'd like to, to participate. At this time, I'd like to uh, recognize our Executive Director, Gary Hutman, for some announcements. Gary? Good morning, Chairman Delari, board members, and all those who are attending online. I'd like to thank you for helping us to make these virtual meetings a success. And we remain dedicated to having good discussions about transportation planning throughout Central Florida. We are doing our best in this environment to stay transparent uh, and accessible uh, to the members of the public. As Chairman Delari mentioned, we'll be using the raise hands feature uh, to recognize board members during the meeting and to call on members of the public during the comment time. If you had joined us on the phone only without the video screen, please use star six to mute and unmute your line. Please use the star nine to raise your virtual hand so the meeting host can see that you wish to be recognized. After being recognized and speaking, please use star nine again to lower your hand once you've rec been recognized. You'll also notice that there's a chat feature on your toolbar, and this communicates with all participants uh, in this meeting that includes board members, staff members, and those presenting this morning. Please only use this if you are having technical issues and need assistance. A full record of the chat comments will be included with the public record of this meeting. This morning, uh, I understand we have three alternates joining us. First, we have Commissioner Gomez Cordero here representing Orange County in the place of Commissioner Siplin. And we have Commissioner Constantine here representing Seminole County in place of Commissioner Zembauer. Uh, I also understand that, that uh, Lorraine Bobo is here representing the Florida Department of Transportation in place of Secretary Purdue. So thank you all for uh, joining us this morning. We had our annual TIP public uh, meeting last Monday on June 22nd. The turnout and participation for this virtual meeting was a record. Um, we're, having, we're hearing this from many other agencies that we're involved with, the fact that public participation and involvement virtually has exceeded that of face-to-face of -face events. And Keith will be saying more about that during his presentation uh, to the board uh, later on the agenda. Uh, the third annual State Mobility Week uh, is scheduled later this year from October 30th to November 6th. I made this announcement uh, earlier this month at the, at the June board meeting, June 10th board meeting. Currently, the state is considering ways to make this event more resilient and how they might host some of the events virtually if, that be, if that's necessary. Um, as I hear more about this, I will make sure that the information is passed on uh, to the board and to our committee members. There's a letter from Secretary Purdue uh, included in your agenda packets this morning. You'll find that uh, in, included in tab four. 
Also, a couple weeks ago at our June 10th board meeting, I mentioned that the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee issued a draft reauthorization bill, and it's known as the Investing in a New Vision for the Environment and Surface Transportation in America Act, or the Invest in America Act. It's also now referred to simply as HR2. Uh, the day after the board meeting, I received a brief but a very good uh, summary of the draft bill, and I forwarded that email uh, to all of you board members, uh, but more detail is included um, in my written report that's found in tab five. But the markup of that bill started on June 17th and went through the evening of the 18th, and so late last Late Thursday night on the 18th, the House uh, TNI committee approved HR2, um, which is a $494 billion um, bill. Uh, and I understand now that the Democratic leadership uh, tends to introduce a $1.5 trillion infrastructure package that will include this transportation bill as one of the titles um, in the larger bill. And that will allow them to, if necessary, pull it out and deal with it separately, but do uh, do look for that. And the word that I received is that they hope to have discussion and, and act on that before they recess uh, for the July 4th holiday. Um, also remember that last year, the Senate Public Works Committee came out with uh, their own bill, and they are working now to advance that as well. So as we learn more, I'll keep uh, the board and, and uh, our partners informed of that. Chairman Delari mentioned the award, one of the eight nationwide crash prediction for expedited detention grants that we received. We're very happy about that. It's an award of nearly $295,000 and, and much of that will be going to UCF. But for this project, Metroplan Orlando will engage other partners, including researchers and the advanced vehicle technology folks and first responders to acquire the needed expertise in data methods, analytics, and information sharing uh, to improve transportation safety. Um, it will also assist us to develop and implement safety strategies to achieve the goal of zero fatalities on roadways in Central Florida. It will help us to meet our federal performance measures for safety. And uh, what's really interesting about this grant and the opportunity it provides is that we'll be working with first responders, the trauma centers uh, for real-time crash prediction and operations. Um, uh, lastly, as Chairman Delari mentioned in his remarks, uh, we will lead the collaboration with FDOT and UCF to make safety tools and information more useful to practitioners by developing and refining them through the use of uh, case studies that address specific safety problems here in the uh, metropolitan Orlando area. Now, we've talked a number of times about our interest in the I-4 corridor and, and um, use of technology throughout the entire corridor between here and the Tampa Bay area. And two weeks ago, we also learned that that FDOT was successful in obtaining a $10 million grant from FHWA uh, for that reason. And so we're excited about that. And, and in fact, Eric, uh, Virginia and I had a discussion with Secretary Tebow uh, following the award of that grant. And he has been a supporter of I, our idea of the I-4 um, uh, regional cooperation within the I-4 corridor. And so this was a call to give him an update and to ask for his continued support on that effort uh, that we're putting into that. Uh, we discussed briefly uh, that this, this $10 million project, this grant may be a catalyst to, to actually launching that effort. Uh, each of these items, uh, the I-4 Corridor Coalition and the grant will be discussed on the July 10th meeting of the, uh, MP, uh, of the Central Florida MPO Alliance um, and the other MPOs across the I-4 Corridor. So Chairman Delari, that completes my announcements uh, this morning and now we'd like to uh, call on Kathy Goldfarb to do the roll so we can confirm a quorum for the meeting. Thank you, Gary. Kathy? Thanks, Gary. All board members, please go ahead and unmute yourselves in preparation for the roll call, and you can go on mute again after your name is called. Make sure your video is on if possible so we can confirm it's you. You'll find the unmute and video buttons on the bottom left side of your toolbar on the bottom of your screen. Please say here or present when your name is called. Alvarez? Here. Arrington? Present. Bates? Here. Bonilla? Here. Delari? Here. 
Demings? Here. Dyer? Dyer? Good? Here. Grebe? Here. Janer? Here. Here. McDonald? Here. Moore? Moore? Nelson? Nelson? <clears throat> Ortiz? Present. Gomez Cordero? Here. Smith? Smith? Uribe? Uribe? Woodruff? Here. Constantine? Here. Mr. Chairman, we have a quorum. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. This time we'll go and ask Gary for the agenda review. Mr. Hutman? Yes, Chairman Delore, I'd like to draw attention to three items on the agenda this morning. There's an item on the consent uh, that is referred to as the FDOT MPO consensus planning document. And this is actually just the second year of approving that document, but it pertains to our acknowledgement of performance measures that we are working with the DOT to uh, and links to work toward those and reporting out on them. Last year, it was actually part of our TIP adoption. Uh, this year, we're doing it a little bit differently by resolution so that we don't need to bring it back to you again um, next year unless uh, some significant change happens to the uh, performance measures. I also want to draw attention to agenda item uh, 10C, which is the organization's continuity of operations plan. Uh, this was last updated two years ago, uh, but with the pandemic, it was time to do it again. The, uh, the copy you have in your agenda packet includes the changes that were made to that document, so you can, you can see that, and then after today, we'll remove the edits uh, for a clean document. But we've also included something new, uh, which is referred to as the pandemic influenza supplement to accompany the um, continuity of operations plan because the, the continuity plan is really intended to address short-term disruptions to our operations that are generally caused by natural disasters, hurricanes, weather-related events and such. But the uh, pandemic influenza supplement is specifically addressing a longer-term event. Um, and you'll see in there what we're doing now to maintain operations. And so the, uh, in the, event that this this continues and, and or happens again in similar fashion we'll have a document that clearly states how we will continue to operate and then lastly i just wanted to include the letter um, um, also under agenda item 10 uh, that we provided to governor desantis encouraging his reconsideration of the june 30th date for virtual meetings that was important to us and ours was uh, one of probably many uh, such requests uh, but as you heard earlier, uh, the governor has approved that and extended that authority at least through the month of July, and, and uh, then we'll see uh, what happens uh, beyond that. Uh, Chairman Dwyer, that completes my comments on the agenda, and there are no changes, so we're ready to proceed. Thank you, Mr. Hutman. At this time, we'll move on to uh, committee reports. We'll first go to the Municipal Advisory Committee. Mayor? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, and board members. The Municipal Advisory Committee met June 25th, 2020. The meeting was rescheduled from July 2nd, and uh, we approved our previous meeting minutes. We recommended approval of the fiscal year 2021, or 2020, 2021 through 2024, 25 TIP, the fiscal year 2025, 26 through 2039, 2040 prioritized project list and the Connected and Autonomous Vehicles Readiness Study. We also received two presentations on the 2045 MTP, including a status update on a congestion management process and an update on the ongoing uh, and upcoming planning task. We also received a presentation on the results of research conducted on bike lane safety and uh, again, I just want to side note, I had an opportunity to sit in on the 2045 
MTP uh, working group uh, meeting and really appreciated that opportunity. Look forward to doing that again. Now, our next meeting is scheduled for September 3rd. And uh, blessedly, this uh, concludes my report, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I'd like to ask staff, do we have any raised hands from the board members? There are no raised hands, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Seeing no questions, I want to thank the, uh, the Missile Advisory Committee. We'll now move on to the Community Advisory Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman um, and board members. At its June 24th virtual meeting led by Vice Chairman Jeffrey Campbell, the Community Advisory Board, a Community Advisory Committee recommended approval of the draft transportation improvement program and the prioritized project list. Committee members also recommended approval of the strategies contained in Metroplan Orlando's Connected and Autonomous Vehicle Readiness Study. CAC members heard updates on the 2045 MTP related to congestion management and future planning tasks, as well as a presentation on bike lane research. Committee members discussed the, with Metro Plan Orlando staff possible impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on future transportation systems. And our next CAC meeting will be on August 26th. Um, as with all of our um, committees, uh, members will wait for updates on the meeting format. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the board? Do we have any raised hands, staff? No raised hands at this moment, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you. We'll now move on to the Technical Advisory Committee. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the board. The Technical Advisory Committee met, met last Friday, June the 26th, and we recommended approval of the uh, transportation improvement plan, uh, the new transportation improvement plan, as well as the new prioritized project list. Uh, also, the uh, approval uh, was granted for the connected autonomous vehicle readiness study. Uh, we've also heard uh, two presentations. The first one was uh, two parts. The first one was a 2045 Metropolitan Transportation Plan con Congestion Management Process. And that was by Ms. Laura Bach. The second portion of the uh, 2045 Metropolitan Transportation Plan uh, uh, addressed the, uh, the status of that uh, plan. And that was presented by Mr. Alex Trauger of Metro Plan Orlando. Uh, last presentation we heard was uh, on the bike lane research by Mr. Mike Wilson. Uh, our next meeting will be on August the 28th. And uh, as mentioned earlier, there's no telling whether or not it's gonna be uh, virtual or live. Uh, and that concludes my presentation, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the board? I'd like to ask staff if we have any raised hands. No raised hands, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you. And now we'll move on to the Transportation System Management and Operation Committee. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. The TISMO committee met on Friday, June 26th. We approved our May 29th TISMO meeting minutes. We also approved the three items of the TIP, the prioritized project list, and also the connected and autonomous vehicle readiness study, along with the recommendations to build the policies and procedures that will help guide our agencies in the planning area in the adoption of these technologies. We had a presentation by Dr. Mohammed Abdel Adi from UCF on the technology for predicting and responding to crashes in Central Florida. This technology is a component of the grant mentioned by the chair earlier that Metro Plan Orlando recently received from the Federal Highway Administration for $295,000. And that concludes my report, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I'd like to ask staff, do we have to raise hands from the board for questions? There are no raised hands, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Any written statements that we need to submit into the record? There were no written statements, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you. This time we'll move on to public comments for action items. Uh, do we have any people that want to speak on this action item, on action items? Uh, if so, please use the raised hand function found at the bottom of your screen or press star nine on your phone keypad. When I call on you, the host will unmute your microphone. You'll see that the host, uh, the button pop up and it says the host wants you to unmute you. Uh, please accept the prompt to activate your microphone. We will then ask that you provide your name and address for the record. Please hold your comments to two minutes or less. I'd like to ask at this time, are there any individuals that like to speak? Mr. Chairman, there are two raised hands. 
Mr. Glenn Cook and Ms. Joanne Canellis. Okay, let's go to Mr. Cook first. Hello, my name is Glenn Cook, 6658 Lake Pembroke Place, Orlando, Florida, 32829. Uh, I am also in conjunction with the University of Central Florida I Corp program. We just completed our study uh, with the autonomous and uh, vehicle for hire study while we were in I Corp over the last six weeks. I've already been in contact with uh, Eric Hill for the CAB study, as well as the Florida Department of Transportation of our findings since COVID-19 has uh, been amongst us since middle of March. And I've also been in conjunction talking with uh, Alex Trieger, uh, Senator Torres, Commissioner Uribe, uh, Renee Palencia, our House of Representatives, District 50. And just to let them know that we are uh, have collected numerous data points with over 4,000 trips for level three, level two autonomy, as well as electric vehicles. So we just want to be able to convey our information uh, openly to everybody to make sure that they're aware. And I look forward to working with everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Virginia, who do we have next? Ms. Joanne Cornelis. Ms. Cornelis. Ms. Cornelis. Um, Joanne, you? if you can hear me, if you. Okay, if you... I got it unmuted. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> now you hear me? Yes, we can. This is Joanne Canellas. Um, I live at one, I mean, uh, 324 Country Club Road, Lake Mary, Florida, 32746. And I would like to have a 24-hour bus and train service, including holidays, weekends, and nighttime. And I'd like to have the bus. A uh, bus stop at um, South Country Club Road and all the way over to the uh, Lake Mary Presco and San Hill train station. You know, the South Country Club Road going to the Seminole State County, so none of us don't have to walk so much. And we need the uh, bus stop over at the um, um, Oviedo Boulevard too for me to be able to go swimming each and every time I go there so I don't have to uh, call so much or anything like that to just go swimming and come home from swimming too. Please, thank you. And we like 24 hours bus and train service including holidays, weekends and nighttime so no one will be stranded. And we like to have this train, sun train, all the way up to um, the land too, please, and you know, at um, Lake County, so no one would be stranded coming to and from the land. Please, thank you. And then the, that's phase two north, and we'd like to have phase three as well, so we can go to the um, that place in 2022 to go down the um, we call it the uh, high speed rail, Virgin Train, um, Virgin Train. Right line. Thank you. Please. Thank you. Anyone else we have, uh, Ms. Virginia? That concludes the remarks, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Are there any written or phone comments that we need to be submitted into the meeting record? There were no comments, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you. At this time, we'll move on to action items. Uh, after each action item, I'll ask uh, for a motion and a second. Please state your name uh, for the record. So the motioner and the seconder, so that we can keep the uh, accurate record. We know who's actually doing it. And then when we're ready for the vote, we'll ask everyone to unmute their mics and we'll take the, uh, the vote on the motion as presented. If you have any questions or comments, please use the raise hands feature, which is found as an option on the participation tab at the bottom of your screen. When you recognize, you can unmute yourself and speak. Uh, if you're having any audio issues, uh, you can also submit your questions via the chat button at the bottom of the window and the moderator will relay your question. Our first action item is consent agenda, which we found on tab one. Do I have a motion? To consent agenda? So move to Reby. Second. second okay. We have a motion is second. Discussion on the motion. 
Seeing none, we'll call the question. All in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, Opposed like sign. Hearing no opposition, the motion passes. Thank you. Now we'll go into other action items, which is the approval of the FY 2021 2425 TIP. Uh, this time we'll hear from staff. Hey, good morning, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we're asking for your approval uh, today uh, by, of the new TIP, which I had previewed on the video earlier this month. And uh, there's a link uh, in the fact sheet uh, on tab two where you can review the draft TIP. And up on the screen uh, is a slide from the video that shows the amount of federal and state funds that are programmed over the five years of the TIP. And these are broken out by the uh, main categories of projects in the document. Uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, we had our uh, virtual meeting uh, back, as uh, Gary mentioned, last Monday, June 22nd, and had a few comments. Uh, one person mentioned the need for a single app that links the different uh, transportation modes in the area, such as links and SunRail and so on. And then there was a comment about the need for better connection between the regional trails in the area. And then quite a few people had questions on the status of the uh, complete streets uh, projects that are uh, programmed, such as Corinne Drive and Edgewater Drive and Orange Avenue. And so there were a lot of uh, interest in those type of projects, as well as on increasing the frequency of bus service and rail service and so on. And uh, last Friday morning, I sent uh, you all a summary of the comments that were given at the meeting and also some additional email uh, comments. And then that afternoon received, we received another email uh, comment regarding pedestrian safety at the State Road 50 Alafaya Trail intersection. And I sent that one uh, separately as well. Uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, and we had a group of panelists from our local jurisdictions and agencies that uh, helped us answer questions uh, at the public meeting. And uh, we'd like to thank all of them for their participation in the meeting. And I just wanted to mention that for our in-person TIP public meetings that we had uh, over the last three or four years, we had an average attendance of about 20 attendees, including staff and everyone else. And for our virtual meeting this year, we had over 70 attendees. So we're very pleased with the turnout and felt that the format worked really well. And the TIP uh, has been recommended for approval uh, by all the advisory committees. So uh, at this time, unless there's any questions, we're asking for your approval of the new TIP. Okay, we'll go to the board for questions first. Do we have any raised hands, staff? I don't see any raised hands yet, Mr. Chairman. We'll give it just a second. Yes, ma'am. Do we have any written comments that we need to read into the record? No written comments, nor are there any raised hands. Okay. Motion to approve, Jainer. Second, Alvarez. Okay. Any discussion on the motion? The only comment that I'd like to add, if I may, uh, I think there is a, a gift here with the virtual meeting that we're getting a little more participation. Uh, and I know the virtual meeting is only because of the executive order. Uh, even though we have... Uh, in the future, we're gonna to have to have public meetings and that's not an issue for full transparency, but there may be, after we have the public meetings to do a virtual meeting as well. I'd like to have Gary uh, Hutton look into that in addition to the actual public meeting to maybe uh, try to foster additional transparency. Maybe something that we can do. Anyway, let's move forward. And see no other discussion. Uh, this is a roll call vote. Please unmute your uh, microphone, Kathy. Kathy, we have a motion. Can we, can we call the vote? Alvarez? Aye. Arrington? Aye. Bates? Aye. Bonilla? Aye. Delari? Aye. Demings? Aye. Dyer? Good? Yes. Greeb? Aye. Jayner? Yes. McDonald? Aye. Nelson? 
Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Gomez Cordero? Aye. Uribe? Yes. Woodruff? Aye. Constantine? Yes. The motion passes. Thank you. We'll now move on to the next action item, which is the approval of the FY. 2025, 26, and 2039, 40 priority project list. This time we'll hear from staff. I apologize with that. My computer froze up on me. <clears throat> Can we start the presentation again, please? <clears throat> I just need a quick second to reset it. Uh, thank you very much. All right, good morning. I'm here to present the uh, project priority list. Um, last month, I presented a draft of the list, which included uh, the project additions and subtractions uh, that went into the 2025, 26 through 2040 um, project priority list. Uh, there's a direct linkage to this list to our 2040 long range plan, and it has to be in the cost feasible plan for the project to go into the project priority list. Um, that plan is fiscally constrained meaning that all of the projects that we've deemed cost feasible have a reasonable rev revenue source behind them uh, for funding through the year 2040. And our list is organized to support the regional priorities as well as Metro Plan Orlando's TMA uh, funding policy. Uh, the list is broken up into a few different lists uh, that include federal and state and then some local projects. Uh, our national highway and state road list includes all roadway widenings, complete street improvements, transportation systems management and operation improvements, bicycle, pedestrian, safety, and sun trail, all on the state road or national highway system. The remaining system, um, we dedicate our Metro Plan Orlando TMA funding to, which includes 32% of those funds going towards roadway or complete streets, 17% towards regional trails and safe routes to schools, 21 for TISMO projects, and 30% for transit capital, which is a little different in this list, which I'll explain in a moment. Um, for the National Highway and State Roads, the top seven projects remained unchanged in the Transportation Improvement Program or in the Project Priority List. That's because the phase was already funded in the Transportation Improvement Program, and we want to make sure that we are funding the remaining phases through construction and full implementation of the project before we bring in a new project into the Transportation Improvement Program. I would like to note last month I mentioned that State Road 50 uh, between Old Cheney Highway and State Road 520 were removed from the project priority list. And this came after the Florida Turnpike has uh, deemed that the um, Colonial Parkway is not uh, financially feasible. But District 5 and DeLand has moved forward with the construction of the six lane need uh, on those sections. We've added them back into the project priority list to give the department more flexibility as they're moving forward and reevaluating that, that six lane project. Uh, other projects that have moved up for anticipation for the next fifth year or next year's TIP are projects like 436 from uh, State Road 50 to the airport. Uh, intersections on Silver Star Road are 438. Uh, the complete street improvement on Orange Ave uh, from Mandalay to Pine Lock. Uh, also the intersection improvement of Orange Ave at Sand Lake. Uh, State Road 46 up in Sanford, intersection and TISMO improvements, as well as the US 192 adaptive signal system. As with the state and national highway list, um, all the top projects remained unchanged in the tip for the Mo Metro Plan Mobility Program. And this is due to the fact that we've already funded some phases and we wanna see them through completion. And that included the Edgewater Drive question that we got as part of the tip. Uh, here are a list of some other projects that uh, we're anticipating moving forward into the next fifth year or next year's tip. They include uh, Central Ave in Kissimmee, uh, Downtown Orlando Bike Study, improvements in Belle Isle, uh, that are coming out of a study that Metro Plan is leading for the city. Uh, Buenaventura uh, Boulevard, Complete Street in Osceola. Uh, Mitchell Hammock, Complete Street in Oviedo. Um, Orange County has 164 signals that they need to upgrade for TISMO. 
and then the International Drive Smart Corridor. Uh, for transit projects, they've remained largely unchanged uh, without a dedicated revenue for operations to implement several of those corridors. But there is a study Metroplan is leading to look at the capacity or the parking capacity at Meadowwoods, Tupperware, and Point Siena Sun Rail stations. Uh, we'll be leading a feasibility study with our partners, Orange County and Osceola County, uh, for that. And we've also dedicated funding for the design and construction, knowing that these facilities are over capacity now. Uh, Lynx is also advancing ITS, customer information, and travel parking system, as well as system expansion and asset management within our project priority list. There are a few other comments that we received from City of Winter Park and uh, Apopka that we would like to incorporate in there. So uh, what I'm looking for is an approval of our project priority list with some minor changes uh, to naming in the City of Winter Park and Apopka, as well as adding the State Road 50 projects back into the project priority list. And with so that moved, Carson, Carson Good moved. Hmm. We, have, we have a motion by Mr. Good, do we have a second? Is there a second? Second, second by your our reading, Jane. <laughs> One at a time, who seconded? it? Second, you Reby. All right, thank you, Commission. I'd like to ask staff, do we have any written statements that need to be read into the record? We received no written statements, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Do we have any raised hands for comments? There is a raised hand by Mayor McDonald. Mayor? Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And thank you, Nick. And I feel like I would be much, uh, would be remiss if I didn't mention again the uh, inarguable importance of a, you know, regional solution to uh, Maitland Avenue and Maitland Boulevard that uh, is providing problems for us every day. And we all know that and look forward to seeing that move up the uh, priority list. Thank you, Mayor. Any other raised hands, staff? None at this time, Mr. Chairman. Okay. So you know the questions or comments, we're gonna call the questions. Since this is not a roll call vote, I'm gonna yes. ask you to unmute their microphones. Uh, all in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed like opposed like sign. Hearing no opposition, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now move on to the uh, connected and automatic uh, vehicle readiness, the CAV final report. I'd like to ask staff to present, please. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, board members. Um, this information is provided uh, in tab four. And just as a review, uh, connected vehicles use in-vehicle technology and sensors to, address, to assist drivers as they maneuver the roadways. It also provides information to roadway detected devices uh, for us as we manage our transportation system. Automated vehicles take these sensors and technology to another level where they can relieve some of the, the driving tasks and actions of, of humans uh, and do most of the driving. Eventually, this technology will advance to where most of the driving tasks are handled by the vehicle itself with connections with the infrastructure. Now, the study um, was looking at or to look at how ready we are as an agency, how ready our jurisdictions are for this technology, but also to look at how informed our public is in terms of this technology and how we can help in that area. So the study is not to answer the myriad questions about the technology, but to see how ready we are in preparing our infrastructure for this technology. Um, the tasks were divided into four um, pieces. And uh, the first technical memorandum that we completed uh, was a review of the technology around the country. The second tech memo that we completed was an assessment of staff, local staff in the jurisdictions in terms of just preparing and getting ready for this technology. Then we had three workshops in each of the, in each of the counties uh, to connect with uh, the actual users and uh, citizens and customers that use our transportation network. Um, so I will be providing a, a a real quick briefing on the workshop, but get into the recommendations from the study. Before I move forward with that, I just want to recognize WSP was the prime consultant on the study. 
subconsultant was Global Five. We had a steering committee that helped us procure the study as well as uh, manage the study. And I just want to recognize these individuals, Frank Consoli from the city of Sanford, Greg Blackadar from the city of Altamont Springs, Hazem Alazar from Orange County, Tony O'Lori and Alex Lassie from Osceola County, Osceola County, Tom O'Hanlon from the Community Advisory Committee, Robert Milia, who's a citizen advocate and system user of Lynx, John Lott, John Slott from Lynx, Virginia Whittington from Metroplan Orlando represented the Municipal Advisory Committee. Next slide. So at our workshops, um, what we heard from the citizens, uh, we put into three categories. There were concerns about safety, privacy, and data security, because these vehicles collect and consume a lot of data, but they also transmit a lot of data. Um, the challenges involved the technology itself, uh, workforce training, and then how do you, how do we store this data and how do we use all the data that's going to be produced? And then the opportunities are just educating our public, uh, knowledge sharing across the agencies. Uh, there's an opportunity to improve equity in terms of how this technology is going to impact our communities, but also the uh, operating agencies in our jurisdictions. Next slide. So the recommendations fall into five categories, planning and policy, infrastructure guidelines, data collection, management, pilot projects, and staffing and training. Next slide. So under planning and policy, we look to our executive leadership, as well as our committees to help us continue the momentum that we started. And that is preparing for this technology and making the investments, uh, understanding the roles that each of us have in advancing uh, this technology and creating an environment so that not only can we take advantage of it, that we can understand how our transportation network is being consumed, similar to a utility. Uh, people that use our transportation network are consuming a resource and this will help us manage this resource. How it ties into our Metropolitan Transportation Plan and how it affects the roles of our committees and our partnerships. So one of the opportunities in our long range plan is to integrate this technology under our technology scenario. How will it impact and change travel behavior? Next slide. Site development, um, one of the curious parts of especially autonomous vehicles and, and connected vehicles, understanding how curb space is going to be used. Uh, one of the features of the automated feature of this, this technology is Transportation network companies want to utilize this. And just like they take up space on our roadways, this will help us use curb space more efficiently so that we can perhaps have pick up and drop off points and monitored parking trends. Um, another concern here is will it create more parking demand or reduce the amount of parking that's needed? In which case that could be a hurt or that could hurt the revenue source for some jurisdictions. Equity, there's vertical equity and horizontal equity. The vertical equity has to do with socioeconomics. Um, underserved communities typically have been left out a lot of the advances in, in technology as well as we have a history of that occurring in the transportation industry. So how do we create, advance this technology and, and ensure that everyone is benefiting from it? Horizontal, uh, that looks at the differences between the jurisdiction. Uh, while Metro Plan Orlando can capitalize investments around our region, it's up to the local jurisdictions to maintain these investments. So how do we make sure that uh, the systems are being maintained? Uh, a road will cross a jurisdiction and a person traveling on that road, they don't care who owns that road or manages that road. They just want to make sure everything is consistent. So how can we share that knowledge and resource? Hello. Hi. Right. Infrastructure infrastructure guidelines. Uh, this is looking at how guidelines are being uh, developed and advanced nationally and how they will impact our industry. Uh, because these, these vehicles and the technology rely on sensors, um, we will make sure, we'll need to make sure that our signalized systems and intersections are kept up, this, up to date. Uh, signage and pavement markings need to be clear and maintained uh, because it's these vehicles using sensors to look for a stop sign. If that stop sign is not clear and recognizable, it could lead to an incident. Um, 
TISMO and ITS guidelines. This looks at just how we advance it within our region, within a, what we're doing as an MPO, how it will uh, change what we do in the area of TISMO. And then maintenance, I kind of alluded to that already with the signing and pavement markings that need to be maintained, uh, but that is also the, the maintenance of staff. And I'll get to that a little bit later. Next slide. Data, data, data. Um, as I mentioned, uh, these vehicles will become, and they are becoming uh, smartphones on wheels and they collect data, they transmit data. And so there's a need to have some data governance on how it's going to be managed. Uh, data collection and storage, because they create so much data, we'll have to make invest investments on maintaining and managing the data. Uh, sharing and security, uh, they go hand in hand because as I mentioned earlier, someone traveling on a road, they don't care who maintains and manages that road. They just wanna make sure it's consistent. So as a vehicle that is collecting and transmitting data crosses jurisdictional boundaries, everything needs to be consistent and it needs to be protected in the same way. Next slide. Pilot projects. We have uh, several projects in our area now looking at this technology like known as one, um, we uh, won uh, Metroplan Orlando, uh, the department in Orange County and UCF have partnered on a Federal Highway Administration grant that we won a couple years ago uh, for $11 million to do just that, to look at um, pedestrian safety in the UCF area, as well as in the Pine Hills uh, area, um, looking at how vehicles are connected on the roadway, and then how we can create a platform uh, in the UCF area for people to make trip, trip choices using data, uh, going to a kiosk to collect or look at the opportunities they have for making their trips. And this involves, again, just using data on the alternatives you have to perhaps driving, walking, or using a bicycle or transit. And this again will be based on a platform. And a lot of this will go, or all the data itself will go into a repository that we'll use, again, to manage this resource, this utility called transportation. Next slide. Staffing and training. Now, this is one that um, everyone is being, being impacted uh, by, uh, whether there are seasonal employees that are moving on. Uh, but as we have a new cadre of staff members coming into our industry, they need to be prepared uh, for managing and developing and analyzing this kind of technology. And then there's retraining staff. Some of the, the training that we received uh, 10, 15, 20 years ago um, is perhaps moved on. And so how we address issues and the challenges uh, in our transportation network is going to need to change and reflect our understanding of this technology. Next slide. So what's next? Um, certainly Metro Plan Orlando can continue its role as a conduit and convener and collaborator of this information, this technology, uh, but also uh, sharing it with our partners, uh, enabling our partners to uh, not only become prepared, but to be ready for it and to see the opportunities ahead of us uh, that will meet this technology as it continues to emerge. Next slide. Pilots, um, certainly the, the recommendations in the study uh, suggest that we continue to look at opportunities to uh, just test this technology, uh, looking at, because every jurisdiction is different. Transportation needs in every jurisdiction is gonna, it's gonna vary. And so the way that you look at preparing for this technology, that's going to change. It's going to reflect the local needs. It's going to reflect local funding. Uh, and then integrating this whole idea of connecting and autonomous vehicles into our long range plan under the technology scenario will be important. Next slide. And I believe that concludes my presentation, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Eric. Uh, are there any questions for staff? We already raised hands. Mr. Chairman, I do not see any raised hands, but let's just give it a second. Okay. Do we have any written statements or comments? Any of you read into the record? None received, Mr. Chairman, and there are no raised hands. Okay. At this time, I'd like to ask for a motion and a second. Move to approve Alvarez. Second, second. Jayner. Okay. Okay. The 
is not this is not a roll call vote. So please unmute your phone. Please unmute your microphone or a phone. Any other questions? All in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Opposed like sign. Opposed like sign. Motion passes unanimously. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll now move on to uh, informational items for acknowledgement. Is there a motion to accept and a second? So moved, Jeribi. Second, Alvarez. Thank you. Are there any uh, written statements for acknowledgement, staff? No written statements received, Mr. Chairman. Are there any raised hands? And no raised hands. All of, see no other questions. All in favor of the motion, see no other saying aye. 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 Opposed like sign. Opposed like sign. See no opposition. The motion, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. We'll now move on to other businesses. We have three presentations. The first presentation is the uh, 2045 MPT. Status update, congestion management process. Here for staff, please. Thank you, Chairman Delari. Good morning, board members. I'm Laura Back. Back with my second installation of my overview of our congestion management process or CMP update. Next slide, please. Uh, so to start us off, I wanted to once again start with a, a definition just so we're all on the same page with respect to what it is we're trying to accomplish when I talk about congestion management. And that is to improve the reliability and performance of our transportation system by reducing the negative impacts of both recurring and non-recurring congestion. Next slide, please. Um, so just give us a snapshot of sort of where we are today. Every year, the Texas A&M Transportation Institute puts out an urban mobility report. And in their latest report, which was in 2019, the city of Orlando, which we're gonna use as a proxy for Central Florida, was the 28th most congested city in the US. On average, the average driver was spending about 57 hours of their driving time sitting in congestion for a monetized loss of productivity of about $1,100 per person. Um, we think we can do better and we intend to do better. Next slide, please. And that's where our CMP comes in. The, the CMP is a performance-based approach for us to plan for congestion management. And it provides us with a mechanism for ensuring that our investment decisions with respect to congestion management are made with a clear focus on the outcomes that we're trying to get to. Next slide, please. So the last time I was in front of you was in early March, right before the pandemic took hold. Um, and I provided a, an overview of the overall CMP process based on the eight step model that FHWA has provided. Um, I did a sort of a deep dive on what our, our, what our goals and objectives are for the CMP and today and for the rest of the presentation, I'm gonna be focusing on the performance measures that we've developed to support the CMP. Next slide, please. So the performance measures are really the bedrock of our CMP. Once we have an approved process in place, I'll be back periodically in front of this body to report out on how it is we're doing with respect to our performance measures, whether we're moving the needle in the right direction. And then um, we as staff and you as a board will be potentially taking action on how we want to uh, change our strategies up to make sure that we are moving the needle in the right direction. So what it is we're measuring really does matter. Uh, keeping that in mind as we were developing our performance measures, we were keeping in mind um, both that we wanted to make them multimodal, that they're consistent with federal guidance, of course, that they're consistent with our 2045 MTP update, and then perhaps most importantly, that there's readily available data for each of the performance measures. Um, we didn't want to have any measures where either data was unavailable, too expensive, or would take too much staff time for us to track down. Next slide, please. Uh, at this point, you're all very familiar with the slide. I think it's actually in Alex's presentation coming up as well, but these are our five goal areas um, from our 2045 MTP update. The same five goal areas are being used to define our CMP. And I'm gonna go through each of the um, sets of performance measures by goal area. Next slide, please. 
So getting us started with the safety and security goal area, there are two objectives within this goal area. Um, the first is to eliminate the rate and occurrence of fatality crashes, injury crashes, and total crashes. And so to that end, we will be tracking for our performance measures, the number of crashes and the crash rate by modes for each of those performance measures. Uh, the other objective under this goal area is to improve our emergency response and incident clearance times. Um, these really come into play when we think about non-recurring congestion. Obviously, uh, those crashes or those incidents do have an impact on non-recurring congestion, but really it's the time to actually clear them out of the way and get back to the all clear lanes that we were looking at. So we'll be tracking the emergency response times as well as incident clearance times moving forward. Next slide, please. Under our reliability and performance goal area, there are quite a few objectives that we have. And so I've divided them for purposes of our presentation into two main areas. The first is our reliability objectives. And we think about those, if you'll focus on the graphic at the bottom of the slide for a minute. Um, when we're thinking about those trips that we make every day, whether it's to work or school or wherever, you know, there are gonna be those fluctuations in travel time, sort of minimal fluctuations. And then every now and then there's a major incident. And, and those major incidents, when we have those fluctuations, those are what everyone remembers. Next slide, please. And so what we are trying to get to is just minimizing sort of the amplitude of the fluctuation so that everyone's drive time is about the same. That's what we're thinking about when we think about reliability. So to that end, uh, we will be measuring the reliability of our overall system, both our interstate roadways as well as non-interstate. We'll be looking at reliability for trucks, for our freight vehicles. We'll be looking at the total hours of delay on the system. And then from the transit perspective, we'll be looking at on-time performance for um, Lynx buses as well as SunRail. Next slide, please. The other part of objectives under this reliability and performance goal area are what I've called our future ready objectives. One of those is um, our objective of trying to expand the region's ITS and actively manage traffic systems. And so to that end, we'll be um, monitoring how many actively monitored roadways we have in place. And when I say actively monitored roadways, we're looking at those corridors that have CCTVs, Bluetooth devices, electronic display signs, um, those that are included as part of DOT's integrated corridor management system. We'll be, we've uh, set a baseline now for which roadways are currently actively monitored and we'll be updating that as we go along. The other objective under this goal area is to adapt to meet changing traveler needs and desires. There are a number of things that we would love to be tracking under this particular objective. Right now, one place that we know we can get data reliably is annual micromobility trips, specifically within the city of Orlando, which is tracking um, the ridership on their e-scooters or their e-bikes and scooters. Some other areas we'll be looking to get better data is ridership on TNCs, um, ridership using automated vehicles, and percentage of corridors that are within a certain distance of electronic or electric vehicle charging stations. Those are all places where so far we haven't found great data sources, but we'll be continuing to track those and those may get added into the CMP at a future date. Next slide, please. Uh, our next goal area is access and connectivity. This is another one where we have quite a few objectives. Um, so the first pot that I put together is our access objectives. And here we're looking to improve access to both high frequency transit, as well as access to essential services across all of our modes. So some of the performance measures we'll be tracking under this goal area include our um, fixed route frequency, uh, the percentage of our route miles by the route frequency, um, the percentage of both jobs and population that are uh, close to our high frequency transit services. And then that fourth performance measure I've listed is bicycle and pedestrian access to essential services. When I talk about essential services, we're thinking about things like grocery and convenience stores, pharmacies, healthcare facilities, government facilities, schools, and restaurants. And that graphic at the bottom of the slide actually shows the percentage of um, the area that you can get to within a 10 minute walking or biking trip to access essential services. So obviously over time, we'll be looking to expand that yellow so that we're able to get to more of those essential services within that 10 minute uh, walk or bike shed. Next slide, please. Uh, the other part of um, objectives under this goal area are what I've called our multimodal connectivity objectives, where we're really looking to improve, improve connectivity, not just for single occupancy vehicles, but also for our other modes. And so some of the things we'll be tracking under this these set of objectives are vehicle miles traveled, our ridership on both Lynx and um, SunRail vehicles, our commuter mode split, 
And then that fourth performance measure is really related back to the objective to develop a transportation system that reflects regional and community values. We thought a good um, measure for that particular objective was to look at how we are spending our TMA funds to support the board emphasis areas. Um, and several of the board emphasis areas do relate back to connectivity. There's trail connectivity, complete streets, as well as SunRail connectivity. So we, we'll be continuing to track that measure as well. Next slide, please. Moving on to our next goal area of health and environment, the one objective that we have identified for this one related back to the CMP specifically is to reduce our air pollutants and greenhouse gas emissions. So to that end, we'll be tracking um, CO2 emissions, ozone emissions, particulate matter, and then other greenhouse gas emissions. Next slide. And then our final goal area is the investment in economic opportunity. The objectives we are um, looking to accomplish here are include reducing delay as well as improving the transportation experience for our visitors. And so to that end, we'll be tracking the hours and cost of delay on the system, which gets back to that slide I showed before, um, showing where Orla the city of Orlando was. We'll continue to track that for our entire central Florida area, as well as um, how well we provide reliable travel times on what we're calling our visitor emphasis corridors. That graphic to the right of the slide, the, the corridors that are in the darker green show a higher percentage of traffic volumes from visitor traffic. And so those are what we're considering our visitor emphasis corridors. So we'll continue to track what the reliability is on those corridors specifically. Next slide, please. So that wraps up uh, the performance measures very quickly <laughs> that we are pursuing as part of the CMP update. Where we are right now, we are um, wrapping up our data collection to set the baselines for each of those performance measures. And we're also completing our analyses to look at where we have hotspots now, where there are congestion issues within our planning area. Next slide, please. And I anticipate coming back to you hopefully next month, but if not the month after that, to report out on where those hotspots are and then also to report out on what specific, specific strategies we are recommending that we move forward with and take into our MTP and the prioritized project list. Next slide, please. And that's all I have for you today, but I'm happy to answer any questions anyone may have. Commissioner Delara, you're still muted. <laughs> Thank you. Before we go to board comments, uh, I'd like to ask staff to have any written statements and maybe read into the record. No written statements, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Do we have any raised hands from the board? I do not see any raised hands at this moment, Mr. Chairman. Any raised hands from the board? There are no raised hands, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you, appreciate the update. We'll now move on to the uh, 2045 MPT status update and technical activities. Great. Uh, good morning, Commissioner Delari. This is Alex Trauger. Um, this month, I will be a little bit different from past presentations where I've provided a, a focused uh, presentation and discussion on a particular topic that we'll be addressing today. I'm just going to provide a very brief overview and provide a status update uh, on where we're at and where we're going to be going over the next six months. Um, just so as, as a little bit of background, we started the MTP update process a little over a year ago. Uh, developing, you know, our, our background data, existing conditions, analyses that, that really serve as the foundation um, for really all of our work. We have to understand where we're at and where we've been before we can move 20 plus years into the future. Uh, we've worked with you as well as our other boards and advisory bodies um, to develop and establish goals, as, as Laura mentioned in her presentation, which really are our guiding principles and will serve as a compass on what we want to accomplish both in monitoring as well as as we're in our investment strategies. Right now we're in the heart of our technical analyses in that, that step three, the past two presentations I've provided have been relating to scenario planning, how we'll use scenario planning in our decision-making process, as well as our needs assessment, um, which I presented at your, at, at, your last pre at your last month's presentation. As Mayor McDonald mentioned, we had a working group meeting uh, just over two weeks ago where we spent uh, about 90 minutes going into those methodologies. Um, that recording is available on our website if, if you're interested um, in, in seeing the longer version of my 20-minute uh, presentation that you received last time. The really intent of this slide, though, is to acknowledge that, you know, come later this year in December, uh, we will be asking for your approval of the, of the Metropolitan Transportation Plan, the cost-feasible element. So let me talk about um, 
where we're at now. And like I said, a little bit of a snapshot recap on scenario planning. As we presented last time um, in, in the previous recap, you know, where we were looking at four scenarios, we introduced that disruptive disruption dilemma scenario at your last meeting. We're looking at those key drivers of change, you know, as it looks at economy, as we look at visitation, as we look at travel patterns, land use and development. Um, and as we get into the scenario planning process and really look at strategies, ultimately we're utilizing this activity to really explore these scenarios and look at the transportation impacts on mobility as, as well as performance um, with unique and specific and significant to each of those scenarios. So again, uh, as a reminder, we will not be adopting a single scenario. We're considering all four scenarios as part of our needs assessment process. Uh, and just a quick recap on, on our needs assessment, as I mentioned last month, and as it's detailed in our working group uh, recording, we're using specific methodology, a unique methodology and approach for each of our travel modes. So we have a transit approach, a bicycle approach, a pedestrian approach. So we're looking at filling sidewalk gaps and, and identifying potential crosswalk locations for further um, for further analysis, as well as a as well as a roadway uh, analysis, which looks at that which looks at freight as well as intersection uh, um, opportunities. So we're looking at uh, utiliz utilizing some of those systems management operation strategies. It is objective driven, so looking at our our objectives and goals that we have, and like I said, using that really as a lens for our analysis and data informed, you know, looking at, um, you know, making sure that we're providing you as decision makers with the best information available. We want to make sure that we're using good data and evidence based approaches and implementation focused. That's really the core of this plan. This is not just a plan to be put on the shelf. This plan is to be implemented to our prioritized project list and transportation improvement program. So we have that in mind as we're identifying projects, as we're categorizing projects based on their eligibility, you'll see a streamlined approach to getting those projects into our work program based on eligibility uh, and based on timeliness. So really next steps, what we're gonna be talking about over the, really the next four to six months, um, in introducing kind of that funding forecast. We've, we've done this in previous plans. It is a federal and state requirement. Um, our financial resources document will identify the various funding sources, whether they're formula, discretionary, um, or other funding opportunities. We've worked with FDOT to, to identify uh, state and federal forecast. We've coordinated with Orange County, Seminole County, as well as Osceola County to develop an existing forecast. So that looks at those uh, existing funding sources in place and how we'll forecast those 20 plus years into the future. That will actually be the funding forecast that we have to adopt uh, per federal regulation for our cost feasible plan. Uh, but we're also including an illustrative forecast. So that looks at sources that may not be in place today, but that could be levied um, or implemented in, in the coming years, you know, through a commission vote or through a public referendum. The financial resources will also include and encapsulate um, our, our SU, our surface transportation modal allocations. That's our board policy on allocating our federal funds that are at the discretion of this board to transit bicycle and pedestrian systems management operations into our complete streets implementation program. And we're also uh, ingraining the board's uh, policy on premium transit for district dedicated revenues. We're up to 30% of those funds could be used for premium transit. So over the next six months and, and what you're gonna be hearing about in the coming weeks is really the outcomes and, and findings from our needs assessment. What are those opportunities? What are those projects? How do we get them into our shorter, shorter term planning documents? Um, but before we do that, we want to make sure we conduct a comprehensive uh, health and environmental screening. So we're looking at those fatal flaws, those red flags, and making sure that we're not just mitigating, but we're doing our very best to restore the environment along the way. And as we have for the past year, we're going to be coordinating directly uh, with local and state agencies as well as, well as our federal partners. And as again, we will be asking for your approval of the 2045 plan later this year in December. Our advisory committees will take it up in November. A recommendation and you will be asked to approve the 2045 plan uh, at your December 9th board meeting. That's really all I have today, Mr. Chairman. I'll be happy to answer any questions that the board may have. If not, uh, we'll be touching base soon in the coming months with more detailed presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Before we go on the board comments, do we have any written statements that need to be read into the record? None noted, Mr. Chairman. Do we have any raised hands? 
Uh, there is a raised hand uh, by Mayor McDonald. Mayor? Mayor? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this was a, a real treat for me to be able to sit in as part of this working group. And Alex and that group have done a terrific job, and I look forward to participating again. Thank you. Thank you. Any other raised hands, staff? There are no other hands, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you. At this time, we'll move on to the next presentation, which is the bike lane research presented by staff. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good, good morning, everyone. This is Mike Wilson with Metroplan staff. Uh, at my last presentation, I gave you an overview of how bicyclists and motorists uh, get into collisions. And this morning, we're going to talk about uh, relative risks uh, with applying the, the exposure data that we've got from our, our bicycle and pedestrian accounts. This allows us to answer some really essential questions of, first off, do bikeways or even sidewalks protect bicyclists from motorist-caused crashes? Uh, what are the factors that are most relevant to these crashes? And then there's an, uh, another interesting question. Um, there's an assumption out there about safety in numbers that if you have more bicyclists that in, uh, out in the out on our roads, that it actually improves motorist behavior. So what we did is we had uh, 10 streets with bike lanes that had been in place for more than 10 years. And then we selected 10 control streets that had comparable characteristics, such as number of lanes, uh, land use, posted speed, et cetera. And then we applied 10 years of crash data. And these were all classified in the way that I showed you last time. Uh, we also did 48 hour bicyclist counts that looked at both position and direction of the cyclist. And we also did some measurements of bicyclist speeds. So we know relatively on average, the speed of a sidewalk bike lane or travel lane cyclist. Before I get into our data, I wanna talk a little bit about how most bikeway studies work. There've been a number that have been re released over the past uh, decade or so that show improvements what they generally do is they'll compare streets with and without bikeways or a, or a street before and after a bikeway was installed. And then just do a very gross uh, count of the number of bicyclists, count the number of crashes and produce a crash rate. But they're often missing some confounding factors in their study. One example is from Montreal where they looked at about half a dozen uh, cycle track projects. And you can see here, this is a pair of streets where they've got their bikeway street and control street. Their bikeway street was a one-way, one-lane residential street, while their control street was a two-way, four-lane commercial street. Now, obviously, those are not comparable. Uh, which, which one would we expect to see more crashes on uh, with or without a bikeway? So not only do we need to keep our, our control streets the same, but we also need to really be asking the question and looking in, in detail at the behaviors. Are we really changing the motorist behavior or is it the bicyclist behavior or some combination of the two? So what I'm gonna be showing you this morning is we're comparing the streets with and without bikeways, but we're counting bicyclists both by position and direction, counting the crashes by the behavior type. And this allows us to give us crash rates by the crash type. Uh, to put this into context, um, if we're protecting bicycles from motorist caused crashes, what's our basis of study? Well, it's uh, only about 2% of the crashes in this study involved a motorist caused crash with a bicyclist using a regular travel lane. Another 10% of them were motorist caused with a bike lane user. And then the remainder were sidewalk riders and then cyclists who uh, violated the, the motorist right of way. When we express risk in this, uh, in this study, what we're looking at is bicyclist miles between crashes. So that means a higher number is actually a lower risk. So starting off with uh, bicyclists just going with the flow of traffic and motorists cause crashes, just crashes overall we do see a higher risk for travel lane, and then the risk goes lower as we move from bike lane. You see about half half as risky, and then actually four times lower risk for the world. But you'll see how this works out as we get into the details. 
It's also important to keep this in comparison to going against the flow of traffic. Uh, it's been known for some time that going against the flow uh, provides some additional risk. Our study showed an even higher risk of, of over five times greater going against the flow versus with the flow. And this is true whether the cyclist is on the sidewalk or on the roadway, although it's legal to go against the flow on the sidewalk. And here you can see the risk for the roadway with the travel lane about five times greater and the bike lane about four times greater risk for going against the flow. But even though the risk was a little bit lower for the bike lanes because there were so many more cyclists using the bike lanes, uh, there were many more the actual number of crashes was was much higher 38 versus six now moving into the more detailed uh, crash types for cyclists going with the flow when it comes to overtaking crashes we did see a significant reduction in risk um, you see there are 92,000 miles for a travel lane and then over six times lower risk for the bike lane user. And this is something we would expect to see because of the, the separation. But it's also important to bear in mind that overtaking crashes are a very small proportion of the crashes overall. In this particular study, only 10 overtaking crashes in 10 years and only one was an incapacitating injury. While there were over 400 other motorist caused crashes involving turning and crossing movements with 60 incapacitating injuries and one fatal. So we move on to the turning and crossing movements. And here again, we do see that there's an improvement as we move from travel lane to bike lane to sidewalk. But then we would have to ask the question, why would that risk be lower for uh, bike lanes and sidewalks when there's no inherent protection uh, at intersections and driveways where these turning and crossing movements happen? A common assumption is that uh, motorists are going to be more likely to scan for and yield to a bicyclist who's in a designated bike lane. But then we have an even lower risk for sidewalk users, and sidewalks are neither designated nor designed for bicycle use. Now, there is another explanation for this, and that is the bicyclist speed. So what we found was the 85th percentile speed for sidewalk riders was about 12 and a half miles per hour. And as you can see here, that requires about 60 feet of stopping distance. The average or the 85th percentile bike lane speed was close to 16 miles an hour. And that required over 80 feet of stopping distance. And then the travel lane users about 18 and a half miles an hour with more than 100 feet of stopping distance. So you can imagine that if a motorist violates a bicyclist right of way, the sidewalk user being much slower is at an advantage uh, in general uh, because they require much less stopping distance. So the, the key takeaway there is our bicyclist crash risk increases with, speed, with, with the bicyclist speed. We also looked at shared use paths uh, that have been in place also for more than 10 years. And these are just side paths where the path is adjacent to a roadway. And we wanted to see how do these compare with uh, a regular sidewalk? So here we did see an improvement. Uh, we've got 67,000 miles for the shared use paths compared to 40,000 for the sidewalks. Uh, the path users were significantly faster. Uh, they're more comparable to a bike lane user's speed. But not all paths are created equal. And here's what I mean. When we, uh, when we looked at these five paths, uh, three of them actually had very few conflict points per, per mile the number of intersections and commercial driveways. You can see there are about four and a half intersections and driveways per mile, and they had a much lower crash rate than the high conflict paths with 11 and a half uh, intersections and driveways per mile. And then if we compare those high conflict paths with the regular sidewalks in, in the bike lane study, we see that uh, they actually had a higher crash risk than the regular sidewalks do. And that seems to be explained by the higher user speeds. There's about a, a third higher uh, speed for the, the path users, as well as about a third higher risk. 
Now I want to move on to that safety and numbers question. And is this really due to motorist behavior? Well, what we were able to do with this data is divide up the 20 bike lane corridors by the amount of total bicycle traffic. And so we have five quintiles here uh, with measured in, in, uh, in, in miles of bicycle traffic. The orange line there is the miles between motorist cause crashes and the green line is miles between bicyclist cause crashes. The first section there, I'm, I'm sorry, the, uh, let me go back. Uh, the bottom quintile we can kind of rule out in that the numbers there are very low, both for the number of cyclists and for the, the number of crashes. Many of the corridors had no crashes. But when we look at from the second quintile to the top quintile, there were nine times as many bicycles, uh, as, nine times as much bicycle traffic at that top quintile. And the miles between motorist cause crashes really doesn't change over that. Whereas the, the miles between bicyclist cause crashes increased more than twofold, almost threefold. So it's really the uh, improved bicyclist behavior is, is what we're seeing in these corridors with more bicycle traffic. Another important consideration is that just because we reduce the risk for an individual doesn't mean that we've uh, reduced the overall crashes because we have more, obviously more users that could still overwhelm it. And that's what we see with the bike lane streets that there was 29% more bicycle travel in inclusive of the sidewalk users. But there was an 11% higher motorist caused crash rate. And by number, there were 34% more motorist caused crashes. And there were also six times as many wrong way bicyclist crashes. All right, we're not advancing here. Give me a second. All right, well, that should have actually been my, my last slide anyway. There we go. <laughs> uh, the, uh, uh, the, the key th takeaway on, on this is that really bicyclist direction and speed and the number of intersections and driveways, those are our greatest crash contributors, um, much more so than the existence or, or, or lack of a, of a bike lane. So that concludes my presentation and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Before we go to questions, I'd like to ask staff, do we have any written statements submitted? We do not have any written statements, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Now we'll go to the board. Uh, do we have any raised hands? No raised hands, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you. I'd like to thank staff for their presentation. At this time, uh, I'd like to ask any member of the public that wish to comment, please use, use the raise hands function and you'll be recognized or dial star nine on your phone keypad. You'll, be un you'll unmute your mic and after you're recognized, please state your name and address for the record. Your comments will be limited to three minutes. This is deep for any general comment items. Uh, I'd like to ask staff if we have anyone that has a raised hand or star nine. Mr. Chairman, we do have one raised hand, Ms. Joanne Canellis. Okay, Ms. Canellis. Yeah, I'm here. This is me again. Yes, okay. we'd like to have a premium transportation for all of Florida, please. Especially okay, all, all of Florida so that no one would be stranded. Like 24 hours bus and train service, including the holidays, weekends, and nighttime and to get all the buses on there that hasn't been on there yet either to get it in there so that no one will be stranded from their um, place either but their home and stuff and work and all this good stuff. Thank you. Ms. Canellis, can, you you. can you give us your name and address for the record, please? Sure. Joanne Canellis, um, 324 um, Claremont Avenue, Lake Mary, Florida. Three two seven four six. Thank you. I'd like to ask staff, is there anyone else that'd like to speak? Raised hands. There are no other raised hands at this time, Mr. Chairman. Okay. 
So now I'll ask the board, are there any general comments that each, any board member would like to uh, present to us or speak about? We have your raised hands. No raised hands, Mr. Chairman. Okay. I would like to just, before we adjourn, I'd like to thank uh, not just the board members for changing the schedule for this meeting, but also staff for making it all possible. Uh, with everything going on, it's, uh, it's important that I uh, uh, want to just reach out to them and say thank you. I also want to just encourage everyone to do social distancing as required by the state as all your local uh, uh, emergency orders. And uh, this concludes our meeting here today. Thank you for joining. This meeting is now adjourned.